Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to the Influencers on Addiction and Recovery discussion. I'd like to welcome all of our panelists and recovery advocates. I want to say uh, welcome to everybody on the call. I'm very grateful to have you all here to be bravely sharing your stories to help other people get help. Um, really shouting out to how uh, awesome that is for all of you. Um, we're going to start today with three different topics. And they're going to go from COVID just briefly. I know everyone's tired of talking about COVID. We just got to touch on it and then we'll move on to um, more in general about this disease. Um, we're going to go into after the COVID is addiction and mental health in general. And then we're going to end with the pros and cons of social media. Um, before we get into that, though, I want to really highlight the panelists on this call today and um, just really shed light to the advocacy and the recovery advocates. I consider you all recovery advocates and panelists, whatever you will, just brave people who are really helping being leaders in this disease um, and recovery. So we've got Mike and Lauren Sorrentino. Um, hi, how are you? Hello, guys. Hi. So I'm sure everybody really knows who all of you are, though I'm going to still highlight some pieces too. Uh, and so Mike, also AKA Situation on Jersey Shore, um, you've been in the public eye for your, while you were in the disease of addiction and now you're celebrating five years. And so yeah. congratulations to that. And Lauren, um, for your uh, struggle with being the wife and also having lost your brother, my heart goes out to you. Um, so, and welcome to be on the call. I really like that. Uh, sounds like you build up on the family piece of supporting your husband, supporting families that are going through it. And so I know that's a really big deal that's not as seen. And so thank you, Lauren, for being that person as well and, and coming out and talking to us. I've got Brandon Novak here. Hi, Brandon. Good to see you. Some of you have been seeing you already. And so hi again. Brandon has struggled with heroin and um, addiction for 20 plus years. And while filming the MTV's Jackass and Viva La Bomb, he cleaned up his act, um, now, like I said, coming up on six years sober, and he's working as a, a frequent keynote speaker on addiction and certified interventionist, um, also a best-selling uh, author and multiple addiction memoirs. Um, and so then, Jason, we've got you doing the firefighters in Florida and uh, mostly known for a lot of advocacy within the uh, first responders and the fire let's say fire department chronicles, um, yes. watch some of those. Those are hilarious, <laughs> especially Thank talking you. about treatment <laughs> and kind of spot on with the making fun of the food and all that stuff. Oh, too. Yeah. So <laughs> those are funny. Thank you for that. Um, kind of a lighthearted way to talk about treatment and some of the comedy reliefs that goes into, you know, getting help and certain things that we do. I'll yeah. honor, I'll own some of that stuff that we do with the deep breathing yeah. and, you know. Mental um, health is a serious subject, but it doesn't have to be approached in a serious way. We can have fun while we're doing it. So, right. yeah. so, so yeah. agree, so agree. Um, and Luke, we've got you here also. You know, and, and your story is really the uh, Kent State football team. Um, you were on your way NFL with the New Orleans Saints, had an injury, um, prescribed opiates, and when the opiates ran out, went to heroin. Um, I, to jump. Yeah. yeah, it's I see that way too often. And so I think going forward, you know, there may be some more to talk about that too, because that's unfortunately a, a story I've seen a lot. Um, and now that you're uh, in sobriety and you're being an advocate for faith and addiction and recovery and really getting that word out to help people in a path. And so all of you here have really turned your stories into a way to help people. And I just really want to honor that and thank you for that. It takes a lot of bravery. Uh, working in the field for 15 years, there's a lot of shame and stigma and you guys are just plowing through that and saying, forget it, don't care, let's do this. And so I really wanna say thank you for being here and being so brave to share your story because that it has a big impact on those seeking treatment. Um, and Lauren, I'm with you too at the family side. So I have a similar story, unfortunately in my history too. And so I think having that family piece come in is so huge because um, we can treat the person without the understanding and education and support, it's real hard for them to stay sober at home, um, you know, not having that. So thank you all. Okay, so I've got to start with COVID. I know nobody really wants to, or maybe I'm speaking for myself. I'm so sick of COVID though. We really do need to touch on it just a bit. Um, and 
the elephant in the room is kind of the COVID talk. Um, I will say there's some really startling statistics that are out regarding COVID. Um, some of them are lower than I suspected and some of them are right where I thought they would be. Uh, we've got an estimated 53% of adults um, reported mental health has been impacted. I think it's higher. <laughs> so I, there's other ones like mentalhealth.org, uh, NAMI, where they show statistics of a 93% increase in reports of anxiety. I believe that compared to 2019, they did a sample of about 1.5 million. Um, it's not huge though. I think it's a more honest representation, at least from what I'm seeing in treatment too. And then a 63% increase in depression compared to 2019. Uh, some, I, I, I agree with that too. I think that I've seen a lot of symptom severity increase, a lot more anxiety, a lot more first timers seeking treatment, which is good. Though I also wonder, is it because there's more disease out there now? Is it more people using because of the times and things like that? So I want to go into a little bit of questions mm -hmm. for each of you. And so Jason, I want to start with you. Um, and as a firefighter and paramedic, um, have you seen any changes in your patient's mental health or demeanor in the last year because of or potentially because of the pandemic? Absolutely. And it's funny because we see it I've been seeing it not only in the, the client or the patients that we're running on, but also in my fellow brothers and sisters that are first responders. You know, for a lot of us, um, you know, the diseases that we've been taught about or exposed to, we're used to it now. Like, we, you know, HIV and hepatitis and, and stuff like that. Like, these are the things that we've been used to and taught. We understand that, like, how low the actual contraction rates are, you know, that kind of thing. So for a lot of us, it's been a scary time because now when we're leaving work, we're truly questioning, like, are we bringing this back to our home lives? So that's really impacting a lot of the mental health uh, for first responders in general. But with our patients for, for the first time, I've been doing this for about 14 years now, for the first time ever, when we come to the front door, they are questioning whether or not they want us to come in. So they're bringing the people out to us, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so we're seeing it from, um, you know, them being very careful with us for, for once in my lifetime, them not being as trustworthy with us because they're not sure. Um, but also it's impacting them because they're afraid to go to the hospital. They don't, unless it's an absolute necessity, they don't want to go. So you're seeing this underlying anxiety of, of, of constant nature with them because again, they're being exposed to something that they've never seen before. They still don't understand the fear is what's taking over a lot of this. So yes, it's, we're having a huge impact on mental health. And then as you said, Said, people are at home more. They're able to drink more. If they do drink, they're, they're bored. They don't know what to do. So they're drinking, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and I think during the beginning of the pandemic, one of the only things that stayed open was grocery stores and liquor stores. So, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to see something like that. And, and that snowballs very quickly. So we end up seeing the tail end of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And Mike and Lauren, both, I wanted to ask you um, over the last year, you've both been working as recovery advocates and I uh, wanted to get a little bit of an idea of how the pandemic has affected your ability to work with families or individuals. Uh, can you share ways that it's impacted that piece of it? Or if it hasn't, either one. <laughs> yeah, um, the past year, like most of us, we've been on quarantine. You know, we uh, we've, haven't been able to travel as much. We haven't been able to uh, go to treatment facilities. We haven't been able to do some of the things that we have wanted to. But we pivoted, you know, uh, the virus has cost has caused us to uh, be more creative. We do intervie interviews from home. We do Zooms from home. We do meetings from home. I think we did more in 2020 uh, than we would do go going to visiting facilities, which I was very impressed with. We had done uh, a meeting and a Q&A um, almost twice a month. Um, and, and along with some of the press opportunities because of the popularity of Jersey Shore, we were able to use our platform to, I think, get it out more in 2020, even though it was difficult than any other year. So I was very proud of us for doing that. Right. I think at first we were a little confused and stressed of like, how do we get in front of people face to face? Because that's where the message really resonates mm -hmm. with especially new patients would be when we would visit Banyan's facilities and you sit down and, you know, everyone's closed off to you. They don't trust you. And then you kind of tell them your story. They understand where you've been. They open up and we weren't, we didn't know how we were going to get that connection, but luckily everyone pivoted really quickly at Banyan and yeah. immediately got on Zooms and that connection was there. So it helped out. Yeah. Thank you for that. I was going to ask how, um, 
different ways that you got the message out there. And I, I, I see that too. I didn't know what Zoom was till a year ago. <laughs> and I, yeah. I also wonder if maybe the younger kids are going to be able to adapt to this easier uh, than maybe myself who's, a, you know, I'm in my forties and I'm like, what is this? <laughs> so I'm glad that it sounds like Lauren, you and Mike have a, a, some uh, easier ways to get to the social media. Cause I, I do think that's going to be, more seen going forward. So thank you for that. And I, I just want to put out there that we've got, you guys are doing like the Hope Dealer and different Instagram live discussions. And like you said, the Q and A. And so really working to get the word out on that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing, we're doing a lot right now. Um, and we work on a monthly basis with Banyan. Um, we've worked with Brandon before we worked with Jason before. So we're so excited that we have this team that we can try to creative ways with YouTube and celebrating each other's, uh, milestones with sobriety to get that message out and sort of, um, use each other's platform to work together to really get this out. So I'm, I'm very excited about this. And Brandon, I wanted to ask you as the addiction, um, intervention professional, it's kind of same question as Mike and Lauren, how has the pandemic affected your ability to see families in person or to work with the clients that you've been working with? Um, you know, Mike and Lauren answered it spot on. Uh, I'm speaking as a, as a fellow who's uh, in long-term recovery from uh, alcohol and addictions and, and narcotics and whatnot. It's, I have a disease that's centered in perspective and perception, right? So how do I choose to look at this terrible pandemic that we find ourselves in? And, and, and how I chose to see it was us simply being divinely inconvenienced, right? Mm -hmm. and, and using the platform that I have to portray that message to, to the hundreds of thousands, you know, millions of, of people to let them know that like, there's a way to stay sober throughout these really inconvenient times. Right. And, um, I can say for myself, because I knew that like the, the addiction that I suffered for 22 years and God bringing me to this point that there was no way he was going to kind of drop me here and say, good luck. I'll see you when I see you. Okay. Um, and, and for me and, and the rest of the team here, I've seen us all excel. And uh, through November and December, uh, I was able to aid and assist the most amount of people that I ever have. In, in the entire five years of working in advocacy, uh, I was able to, to open a men's recovery home that allowed 11 gentlemen transition directly from treatment into, you know what I mean? I, 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 I refuse to see this as us being powerless. Like that does not make sense. And I think that speaks to the rest of the people on this panel. You know, we kind of find opportunities and options in these really terrible situations. And I think that's what allows us to prevail. I agree. I love that. I would have stopped the COVID talk there because that's a perfect way to end it. I, it's ending it on a, how are we doing this despite? Instead of giving up, we're not victims. We're going to reach out and get more people. And so thank you all for that. And we are now going to move away from COVID. <laughs> so um, appreciate that talk. I want to get into now a little bit about addiction and mental health in general. Um, I know in my time working, I found they really uh, go together. Um, I've rarely seen just the addiction. And if it does start out as just the addiction or maybe just the prescription, it soon turns into mental health issues um, as it goes on. So I definitely see those together. Uh, and so Luke, I wanna start with you um, as a former athlete and you know, still doing some athletic stuff now, how, Discipline. Uh, the word is discipline. I'm looking for. And how has discipline helped in? Um, I, I can see how it would help with the athletic part. Has that helped you at all with staying sober? And how has discipline played a role? Um, and even open that up to what works for you to stay sober. So if it, you know if it's not discipline, kind of what is it that has helped you stay sober? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, what a blessing to be here you know, watching Mike and Brandon. And fortunately, I didn't know you, Jason, at the time. But um, just to have this team um, and to be able to look back and to see what God has done in my life over this past four years has been incredible. And I can tell you about discipline. I've never regretted an act of discipline. And um, for me, it's just become like a daily routine, you know, first thing in the morning, um, something spiritual, whether it's my Bible or just for today, and then getting into the gym. I actually haven't missed a day in the gym, um, even if it was just 30 minutes, 
since I got sober. So just really building that so that when crazy things like 2020 happens, you fall back on that. You know, you fall back on your on things that you've built. And so often in early or in addiction, really, we we have that we can't we lose the lack of impulse. You know, we just the first urge or the first thing that comes to our mind, we 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 act on it. And one thing I encourage people to start building that discipline is to get around like minded people. Um, one of my favorite coaches told me you become who your five best friends are. Mm-hmm. And one of the biggest things that shifted for me were the people I was hanging out with versus the people I was hanging out with in recovery. And those were the guys going to the gym with me. Those were the guys I was hitting meetings with. Those were the guys I go to church with and still to this day. So to build that discipline that I had in sports and that I have in my recovery now, the biggest thing is to get around people and just like we were talking about, you have to get creative, whether it's, there is a ton of Zoom meetings. Um, like Mike was saying, I think I attended more meetings this past year than maybe I did previously, you know, so I was able to build relationships in a different way. And I encourage people in early recovery um, to, to find those ways and, and just trust God. You'll look back and, and you'll see how far he took you. So um, get around good people at, at all costs. It sounds like the perfect uh, routine for staying sober is gym, tan, and laundry. Yeah. <laughs> I, listen, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to pitch Mike after this on doing a you know a gym tan recovery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, my, my recovery is definitely very similar too. I I fall back on uh, my routines uh, and discipline of self care and self love. Exactly what he's saying. And I feel just like a, a vehicle. If you don't wash your vehicle, if you don't put gas and oil in your vehicle, um, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna fall apart. So you have to take care of your body. So I'm, I'm a big believer in the approach of taking care of mind, body, and spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. I want to stay on this for a minute. I think it's so important talking about self care, self compassion, taking care of yourself. It sounds, uh, it can sometimes sound easy, though. It's really hard, too, is to take a moment and get out of the drama of whatever's going on and really focus on yourself and how are you feeling? What are you doing? I know a lot of times I tell my clients, just because you have a craving doesn't mean you have to act on it. And they looked at me like I'm, you know, like <laughs> they're new in recovery. They're going, what are you talking about? And do you have any tips for self-care and or not acting on that impulse? Like, what has worked for you? What can help our listeners today? I know for me, um, acting off impulse was kind of par for the course with addiction, right? I think I do. Uh, I, I want to leave treatment. I leave treatment. I want to get high, get high. And, and, and what I recognize is 99.9% of the times I always regret those decisions that I had made off impulse. And, and then when I was finally like really serious about sobriety and, and in just enough pain that I allowed it to become my purpose, which um, uh, tended me to be open-minded and just willing enough to follow your suggestions. I, I had a really clever therapist who said, you know, stick to the basics. So God willing, you don't have to go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. So kind of going back to the last question, every day I wake up, I have a routine. I I, I don't, I don't sway from it. Um, You know, because I learned that the determination equals desired destination. Right. And, and um, uh, another thing he said was that feelings aren't facts and feelings pass. And I remember the first time I was in rehab and I, I, I wanted to leave treatment and I wanted to get high and, and thank God I had went to a different state. So I didn't know the state that I was in. Like it wasn't my backyard. I didn't know like the back of my hands. And, and yes, I could have left, but if I left, it was going to really be a pain in the ass. I, I didn't know like the, the trains, the buses, the, the, the wires to get money. And, and uh, it was just more work than it was worth. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to. And lo and behold, I didn't leave. And guess what? That, that feeling past, right? Because I didn't act off impulse. And what I did was I used that as a stepping stone because believe it or not, those feelings occurred again. And then I could relate back to like the last time that I wanted to do that and how bad and how detrimental it felt and realize that feelings aren't facts and they pass. I also think understanding that normal movement 
of feeling like we were so comfortable with like the two sides of the pendulum. We're okay with being extremely angry or extremely happy, but we're not okay with not being okay. Like we always like to say, right. That, that uncomfortable feeling of like you wake up and you don't feel the same way that you, that you did the day before you weren't as happy. Like for me, a lot of times if I get up and I'm feeling a little under the weather, I'm more tired than I normally am. I kind of start, I think back about the last 48 hours. Oh, I did really heavy deadlifting and back squatting. My CNS is destroyed right now so like this is a normal thing to feel right so i have to stop for two seconds think about what just happened oh and now i can i can actually put a correlation of why i'm feeling this way to where how i'm feeling and then a lot of times it allows you to uh, have those things pass i i also think it's uh it's okay not to be okay sometimes you know what yeah. i mean life is not perfect life is going to happen on life's terms and also, I think uh, I'm wise enough and mature enough to know that when you're uncomfortable, when you have that feeling, um, that's when you're going to get some growth in life, you know, whether it's mentally, physically, or spiritually. So I think what might help some people is thinking, you know, the one day at a time, you know, also what Brandon said is getting back to the basics. Okay. And if you're always in the present moment and, you know, you work towards working your body and, and you go to your meeting and you go through your checklist and your routine, like Luke said, at the end of the night, you let down and put your head down on the pillow and you're like, you know what? I did good today. Let go and let God. So for one day at a time, we don't use every single day, repeat. And eventually you'll turn around and like, oh my God, it's weeks, it's months, it's years. Brandon's about to hit six years. I just hit five years. And that's the reason why we are, we are where we are. Yeah. One yeah, thing great. to add, I would love to add is, you know, and I see this people leaving treatment. I, everything for me comes from like a sports background. And I had this coach that drilled this into my head and it drove me crazy at the time, but he said, failing to plan is planning to fail. And so uh -huh. knowing I'm going to put myself in an uncomfortable situation, maybe it's leaving treatment in another state to go back home. Uh -huh. um, making sure that there's things in place, people to check on you, um, having someone check in on you. I know early in my journey, like three months sober, I had to go back home for somebody's uh, funeral and I had vivid using dreams. And then I went home and, you know, had this incredible urge to use like undescribable to someone who's not in recovery and ended up flying back to Florida early. But luckily I game planned um, to really help myself from something like that happening. And so I always encourage people to have a healthy respect. We're not going to fear our addiction, but have a healthy respect for it and to put a game plan in place for situations that we can control. Yeah. yeah I, I really, I really like that. What you just said, because the best math you will ever calculate is how to calculate a good decision. Mm. And, and in treatment, that's what they teach you. They treat you the, they, they teach you the tools to run the tape or, or not to make those decisions or not to be around those negative places, people or things. So once they have those tools in their tool belt, they're better equipped to handle life. But until then, they're just sometimes, you know, sitting ducks, you know, not making good decisions. And yeah. I think, I think to add to the self care piece of it, it's the best advice we always give to people who are having a hard time getting motivated to work out or there's too much comparison when they're in the gym, we always say, listen, the hardest part, the hardest step is walking into the gym. Yeah. Once you're there, whatever you are accomplishing, if it's a 20 minute walk on a treadmill, or if you're doing, you know, a 90 minute hit interval class, as an advanced person, you're there to improve yourself. Mm -hmm. So the hardest step is just walking in. Mm. Right. I think at the end of the day too, it's, it's a really rad thing to just be grateful to feel, Ooh, right? Like, like if you are an addict or an alcoholic such as myself and you literally live to use and use to live, um, I spent a lot of money to try to feel a certain way. And I was always let down inevitably time after time. And if I did get the feeling I was in search of, it didn't last. So it was very short lived. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so it's like embrace the, the changes. I, Mike said it, you know, when, when I, there's no growth in me when everything is like a, okay, you know, it's when my back's against the wall and I have to rely on the scariest thing in the world, which is the faith that the God of my understanding who has brought me here is going to continue to bring me there. That is terrifying, but it works. My history states that it's a real experience because if it didn't, I would not be here. Yep. Thank you. I, I hear a lot of the, um, 
that that you really value your recovery. And what I often hear in the rooms and in treatment is the way, you know, one way to stay sober is to work as hard to stay sober as you did to get high. Yeah. And it sounds like you guys work real hard and that it's not a terrible work. It's a work that you do that helps yourself feel better at the end of the day. You feel better about yourself. So thank you for that. I appreciate all your guys' um, input. And Lauren, I wanted to ask, well, um, you know, watch with Mike and Mike, if it's okay, I'll put you on the spot a little bit. Being the, the wife and, and being, you know, the family member to your own family, um, what has helped you support your family, even through the moments of fear? Um, and what I'm thinking of is, in my own life, it's, if you don't talk to them for a certain amount of time, it's like, oh my God, did they relapse? Or, oh my God, is everyone okay? How do you kind of manage your own, if you do have that experience, kind of your own um, self-care around your loved one's recovery? For me, it really was my faith. My, my foundation is always rooted in my faith. And at my lowest points in life, I clung to that because that was all that I had. Um, if you think about, I'm, I've never been an addict, so I, don't, I didn't understand it for the longest time. And when my brother was struggling, I just would want to shake him to fix him. <laughs> And it, you, the, the talking to him or not talking to him or enabling or not enabling or like, you don't know the right decision to make. And there is no right decision. And when the families ask me now, like, should, the, should I let them move back home? Should I do this? Should I give them a job? It's like, there is no right answer, but you need to find mm-hmm. like the, whatever your foundation is, whatever your higher power is mm-hmm. to lean on throughout that process and to guide your choices and your steps because that's the only way you're going to live with the choices that you can make. So it's just, it would just bring me closer to God at any point that we were going through stuff like that. And that's what I should kind of try to advise to everybody. Thank you. I appreciate that. I know we're going to have a lot of families viewing in because Danny does a lot of family zoom week um, calls and things like that. So I really appreciate that, Lauren. I, I wholeheartedly agree. It's um, it, and it, we've really got to focus on ourselves. Like your answer was, what are you doing to help yourself rather than how to micromanage Mike? <laughs> we, we, you know, it doesn't work, right? It just yeah. makes the person frustrated. So yeah. thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, and so going on to Jason, I got a question for you. Um, plainly, I guess, simply, what is the fire department chronicles going on a little bit about what made you start it? And um, what's your goal with these? So a lot. So I started fire department chronicles just to have some fun with my, my brothers and sisters in the, or my fellow crew members and stuff. And we were having a good time, but it quickly, uh, and again, it's just funny videos. I, I, I've always said that, you know, um, humor is very relatable. It's whatever like you find funny or, or whatever you've experienced throughout your life that you tend to find funny. So I started putting these videos out, but what was really cool was after about six months of putting them out there, I started getting a lot of messages, guys, like uh, guys and girls, like, Hey, this is really helping with my mental health. Like we come back from a bad call. We, you, we see you put something out about, you know, different calls that you run or different firefighters that you work with. We laugh. And a lot of times it opens up conversations about things that we've experienced within the, uh, um, the shift itself. And and what it's allowed me to do is bring up mental health and make it very, you know, there's not a stigma, like who cares? Like you should be okay with yourself. I'll share something personal right now. Uh, about 30 days ago, I decided to stop drinking. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I didn't go, go to rehab or anything like that, but I said, um, I, I was, I don't, I don't know if I was drinking too much, but the amount that I was drinking, it was making me cloudy minded. I couldn't think of ideas the the way that I used to. I couldn't process information the way that I like to be able to process it. And I was like, maybe it's the alcohol. And I stopped drinking and it's been great since now I'm like firing off stuff like crazy. But um, I, I went out and got uh, some lunch with a buddy of mine who's a firefighter and we were eating and he's like, I'm going to order a beer. Do you want one? And I was like, nah, I'm good, man. I'm not drinking right now. And there was like this moment where he's like, Wait, you're not drinking? Like, what's wrong with you, dude? I'm like, there's not to be anything wrong with someone because they don't want to drink. So I, I, a lot of people, they find this shame in it. But for me, it's like, hey, this is who I am. This, I don't want to drink or I don't feel like it. I don't like the person I am when I drink. So, um, you know, bringing mental health. And when I'm depressed, I go to a therapist. When I'm not okay, I identify it, you know. So the, the videos have allowed people in general to look at 
mental health in a humorous way, but approach it or be serious about the subject itself. So thankfully it's worked. And, you know, if anything, I'd, I'd rather be a poster board out there like, hey, um, if you like to do X, then do X. Don't worry. Don't worry about what people are thinking about you as long as it's not harming you or anyone else. Be proud of who you are as a person and why you made the decisions that you made. I love that. I want to touch on that, too, because I also, even though I'm not, you know, in recovery, I'm more in the Al-Anon and the CODA side. Um, when I choose not to drink, I get the weirdest looks. And I'm like, I just, I don't want to, (laughs) you know, but it's almost like I have to justify, you know, or maybe let me just get like a glass of club soda and put a lemon or something. Um, And so I wanted to know if anyone else has that experience and maybe that could be our next break the stigma. It's okay to be sober. (laughs) It's okay. Um, In the beginning of my recovery, uh, I was filming uh, season one of Jersey Shore Family Vacation. It was definitely the first time I was sober and it definitely was a bit awkward. People don't know how to, you know, uh, handle social situations where someone says I'm not drinking. They to- it totally flies by their head. And three seconds later, you want a shot. You're like, I could have sworn I just told you that I'm not <laughs> drinking. But now going on five years, everyone I think knows by now I'm a million times better sober. You know, I'm funnier. My lines come out quicker. I look better. Uh, I'm smarter. I'm, I'm better, better of a man. It's just the way that I'm made. Uh, it took me a while before I was able to find out that this obsessive personality that I had, um, that I can fine tune it and direct it towards positivity. And as I call it, my superpower back when I was in my twenties, I didn't know how to direct it. I, I, I was like the super villain of reality TV. I didn't know what I was doing. And, um, eventually I learned to, like I said, fine tune that to now, uh, you know, all my behaviors are positive and I always exhibit balance, which is key. So I always tell people about that. I think it's just a side note. I've always said, I think it's impressive what Mike and Brandon have done. Like their platforms were built on, you know, alcohol and having fun and doing, I don't want to say stupid things, but you know, party. Uh, And they took that reversed to it and became like true advocates for you don't have to base your life off of those things you can if you're if you're heading one way you you, you know you drive a, a red car now I want to drive a blue car and and that's what my life is and I tell you it's it's super 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 impressive what both of you guys have done thank you thanks a lot Jason I was actually going to say you know my 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 drinking and my drugging was done on such a public platform for so many years that it kind of uh it, it allowed me to create this character which for any alcoholic or addict, it was like a, a junkie's dream because the the more outrageous my behaviors were, the more outlandish my antics are, the the higher the ratings went, the more in demand I became, which meant the more money that I made. Um, and then what happened was the party stopped being a party and, and, it, and it paid nothing but pain and misery. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went, I got sober, I stayed sober. And, and what I've learned is that like, you know, two years into my sobriety, I was out in LA and I found myself sitting in a, in a bar restaurant with uh, Nikki Six from Motley Crue and, and Kat Von D, who's like this crazy wild tattoo artist. Um, and, and we sat in this restaurant and talked about recovery for like two hours. And never in a million years did I think I'd be sitting with someone from Motley Crue or this chick tattooed from head to toe, um, speaking about recovery and like really getting high over it. And And what I've learned is that like, Today, sobriety is what like the cool people are doing. When yeah. I when I go out, people know kind of what Mike said too as well. Uh, people know that I am much better without a drink or a drug. So I am never offered, right? Like people just widely know that it does not work well with me. Um, but what happens is on, let's say like a, a rare chance in hell that it may happen and, and I decline a drink. People find it really admirable that I can be in such a social setting and be so okay with myself that I do not need to have some kind of, uh, you know, alcohol or drug to take me outside of my place to feel as if. Mm-hmm. So I, I always say, man, I, what I try to do, because what I've learned is that addicts and alcoholics, all we are is defiant by nature. We hate authority and we will never conform. Why? Because we possess this job that consists of knowing everything. So thank you for trying to suggest what I should do to better my life, but I'm going to suggest why you should get lost. So I try to use my platform and, and deliver this message um, in a form of attraction rather than promotion. One thing I want to add to is I think it's, I think people entering <laughs> recovery need to grieve the loss of alcohol it's, it's just like losing a family member in some sense. It's, it's our comfort. It's all we know. 
And I know when I entered, I was like, I'm going to quit doing pills, but I can have a drink every so often. Yeah, I did and then that. as I started, you know, being able to read the end of the book, I realized that wasn't in the cards for me. Yeah. But the beautiful thing is you don't have to not drink forever. You just have to not drink today. And then at some point in time, you'll look back and that's when you'll thank God for all the blessings that sobriety has given you. I, I see us breaking that stigma now is like, it's okay to be sober. You don't have to be having a drink. And, you know, like Brandon, you touched on, it shows that you're comfortable in who you are and that you're stronger. The fact that you can be sober and have fun, it's a strength. It just, it's more character building on being able to be yourself and not have to be intoxicated. Yeah, I appreciate it. And it's, it's a way of us again, breaking that stigma of, you know, talking about staying sober as being a, a great thing to do. And I definitely see the being sober as more cool, if you will, than being high. And yeah, I've always said that, um, and I mean it in my heart of hearts, I always say that sobriety has given me everything that alcohol ever promised me. And, and I really mean that. And the only way I had the ability to find out the truth in that statement was to stay sober long enough. Yep. And now coming up on six years sober, this miraculous event has, has transpired. And what that looks like is this. I, I've now been sober long enough to, to be blessed uh, with this beautiful life that I value so much more and find so much more appealing than even the notion of going to the pub and having a glass of wine or, or to Kensington to buy a bag of heroin. Yep. The, now, you know, the abnormal used to be the normal in way of like, how do I go a day without having a, a shot of heroin or a glass of wine? Now it's like, what in the world would ever make me want to have a glass yep. of wine or a shot of heroin? That psychic change has completely taken place as a direct result of the spiritual experience that was required for my obsession to be lift or the desire to be removed because no human power could ever do it. Brandon, I think I know what your next book needs to be. Just Brandonisms. You have more like phrases, sobriety through phrases, man. <laughs> it's awesome. My mind is in your book. <laughs> um, and so I want to go down. Luke, I've got a question for you now. Um, actually, Brandon and Mike, I'm not done with you. I've got one I want to touch on before we move to the next is it's about destigmatization. We're on it right now. Um, I talked to you a little bit about my dissertation study in 2011 was on treatment seeking behaviors, uh, barriers, uh, stigmatization, and it was hands down. Everyone that participated in my study had felt stigma. And it was a men's group and they were uh, in treatment saying they were on vacation and their families were covering for them. And it was um, this really shameful experience at the time that at least with the group in LA that I was studying. And I think now if I did that study today, I don't think I would have the same outcome. And I'm really um, getting chills from that. I'm really pleased about it because I do think that there's a destigmatization that's going on where people can say, I'm going to go get help at treatment. And, you know, like Jason says, and make fun of it and have fun with it. And, you know, I'm going to sit in a circle and hold hands and do all those goofy things that treatment can, can provide. And, and that it's a funny thing. And it's also not a shaming thing to get that help. Uh, and so I, I think you touched on it a little bit, but Brandon and Mike and, and everybody here, what has it been like um, opening up about recovery, maybe even at the beginning, or how has it impacted your life now? Being in the public eye as somebody in recovery, um, I know, Brandon, you said a lot about that's like your newfound calling, and you're happy, and it's, you know, made your life better, um, but can you talk a little bit about what it was like when you first came out into recovery, and then maybe where it is today? Anything on that? There wasn't like a day or a specific event that I can look back on and say, that's when I came out. Right. Like what, what I remember was I, I completely bought into the notion of the 12 step program that I belong to. Right. I, I didn't resist. I didn't question. I was just in such a painful position that I was willing to follow whoever that suggested something that seemed to make sense to me. Or even if it didn't, I just knew that my way no longer worked. And what happened was I, I, I was attending these meetings and and uh, then finally, like someone asked me to speak and then someone else asked me to speak. And then what happened the first time I, I was asked to speak at this candlelight vigil and and I had no you know, intention to going in there for a specific reason, except to just try to say something that might 
change the the course of somebody's life, really. Um, but my intentions were sincere and my motives are proper. They were not financially driven or motivated by any means. As a matter of fact, I was I was living in a recovery house, paying one hundred and sixty five dollars a week, working as a dishwasher at Marianne's Diner in Levittown, Pennsylvania getting paid $6 an hour next to a 14 year old kid by the name of Brian. <laughs> right? So you want to learn what like humility looks like swallow <laughs> that pill. Um, but that was like one of the biggest foundations for my sobriety. Um, and, and what happened was I'm not capable of outthinking myself out of the disease of addiction. If I could have done that, I would have done that years ago and I would not be here with you lovely ladies and gentlemen. My, my goal in life was not to attend 12 step meetings the rest of my life, believe it or not. Um, but what happened was I changed my beliefs. I, I changed my behaviors. And in changing my behaviors, then I could change my beliefs, kind of without me even knowing. And, and, and what happened is people started, Luke alluded to it in the beginning, surround yourself with the five best friends that are doing what you want. My mother ingrained that to me as a child. Show me who you walk with and I'll tell you who you are. Um, and, and my behaviors changed, my beliefs changed, and the quality of my friends and and, and coworkers have changed. The quality of my life has changed and it's everything has just gotten better. There's not one bad thing that has come from sobriety with me or more so for my family or anybody that I'm involved with on a daily basis. Right. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the stigma in general for a lot of people has started to change. Um, what, I, what I'm actually excited about, so firefighters for a long time tried to change uh, the way we looked at dirty gear and stuff and the cancers and stuff. And it was a badge of honor to have super dirty gear. And we were saying like, dude, this is going to give you cancer. And a lot of people didn't want to change away from that. Well, when mental health came up, it was the same thing. Like, you're not a man. You're like, you can't, you can't be a firefighter. You can't be a first responder or a police officer if you're having mental health issues. And thankfully, People are quickly going to that because there is a measurable uh, outcome if you don't change your uh, sobriety or your mental health issues. You, you kill yourself. That's how that goes. So there was a measurable amount of information that people could look at. And thankfully, because the culture is starting to shift, we're seeing uh, that stigma being removed away because saying, yo, I'm not okay today is totally okay because you, you cannot be okay today and totally fine tomorrow if you address it at the beginning of your of the problems you know it doesn't have to be when you are you know in an alleyway or when you want to kill yourself like you could literally be like that was that was really bad what happened to, to me today yeah validation yeah it actually did happen that that is not okay and then continuing the process from there and just to go on the whole my grandma used to say if you hang out in a barbershop long enough you're eventually going to get a haircut like that's that's she always said obviously that's very ironic yeah but, uh you know just things to think about you know, I want to say something real quick before I get it. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon your perception, the stigma is lifting because the death toll is rising. Hence us doing this virtual conversation with influencers that have a substantial amount of clean time. So God willing, right, the, the thing that was the problem can now become like the answer because people that couldn't stay sober or just didn't want to now see these 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 guys up here and and women that are doing these extravagant things all without the use of a drink or a drug and they're like if they, i want what they have and yep. that means if i want what they have i should do what they do and maybe yep. i should put my hand up or reach out for help you know it's yep. all a direct correlation if you can just kind of step back far enough to see it for exactly what it is yeah i i did i did this for you know to save my life like brandon said like i was gonna I wouldn't be here today if I had the same negative behaviors and, you know, and the support of my wife to keep me on track. I'm now five years clean and sober. I have people all the time hitting me up. I want to be like Mike. I want to be like you. You know what I mean? Like, well, how can I do that? Like, you know, I have more people hitting us up. Like, how can I get in treatment? I, I definitely think that the destigmatization is happening for sure right now. I just celebrated five years uh, clean and sober this past month. And um, it's like national news, you know what I mean? It's on like the big platforms, which I celebrate. I, I wear it like a badge of honor. And if I get on those big platforms, it starts to change things. And I'm happy about that, you know? Um, and now people, people are like, I, I wanna be like that too. Like, you know, so, but in the beginning I did it to, to save my own life. And I did it one day at a time. Those one day at a times added up to, yeah. to now five years clean and sober. And also, in the beginning of recovery, 
when you start to get into the one year and the two year and you get away from the temptation and the negative behaviors, like Brandon said, you start to get on cruise control. You know what I mean? Your, your life is not like this anymore. Now you're sort of like a steady incline. You're, you're achieving the milestones that you would only achieve uh, with steady progress. You know what? He's not lying. People hit me up on a daily basis and say, I want to be like Mike, the situation. You're <laughs> like, the wrong person. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell you all, I, I, people, clients come in and they'll reference your stories. I, I mean, they'll say your stories and it's no small thing. The fact that you all are here and you're talking about this, you're paving the way you are doing something different that 10 years ago wasn't being done. And so I want to pat yourselves on the back yes. because it is like a huge, huge uh, accomplishment to have the bravery. And, and, and maybe at five years, six years, you know, may not feel as brave, but I'll tell you, I've been in the field 15 years, so I've seen it change. And it's finally going in the right direction with people wanting to get help and getting help is a good thing and it's the right thing to do and being healthy and meditating and focusing on your mental health is actually uh, not dorky anymore. <laughs> you know. Um, or, and if it is good to be a dork, whatever. Right. But the fact that you guys are all here is just huge. So I really want to say, and you know, Lauren, you being here to support and all of it, it's such a, it's a family thing. It, it really is. And um, I can't say enough about that. It's, so I just really want to say thank you again. I'll probably say it five more times, but yeah. <laughs> you got to know my history is I've been in this field a long time. And a lot of it was really trying to find clients an avenue where they can feel good about being in recovery. And that is, that is such a hurdle. <laughs> Lou, I'm yeah. sure there's a message out there for somebody wanting to be like us. I doubt it, though. Yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll add something. I think all of us have seen a great pain in our life become a purpose. Mm -hmm. And one thing everyone should understand about this last topic we just touched on is we've all had a spiritual experience at some level. And I believe that we, especially for myself, I'm rooted in my faith in Jesus Christ. And so um, it was totally freeing to, to have that relationship, but it also breaks off uh, this other external life that I was trying to live anyways and it was driving me into a deeper hole of addiction. So understanding that we're, we're so blessed, um, but it's also driven in a, in a faith experience that I believe, um, you know, all of us have had. It, you know, it, it really is such a, a family disease. It, not just the, the addict or alcoholic suffers. It, it, it spreads. It migrates throughout the whole thing and it, and it ravages. It does not understand, you know, race, religion, creed, lack of religion. It, it knows no boundaries. Um, but, you know, what's the raddest thing? And it's funny that we're talking about this, you know, right before this, my mother called me and my mother is my everything. And, and she's the same woman who bought me a plot. She's the same woman that, 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 that took life insurance policies out on me that, that served me with a restraining order that, that went to God and said, please cure him or kill him. I swear to God, right before we called on this, she called me and she, she said, uh, Barney, she calls me Barney Fife. She said, Barney, I'm just calling to tell you today is five years and eight months clean and sober. So I agree. Days to me kind of blur together. I don't count them anymore. And that's truly a blessing. But you know who does count them? My loved ones. And that's the biggest blessing in all of this. Awesome. Love that. It's great. I just also feel that, you know, life can be really tough at times. Why add to it with a substance? And case in point example, if you're going to drive a vehicle, right, and you decide to drink and drive, if you calculate that decision, guess what's going to happen? You're most likely possibly going to crash, uh, hurt someone or yourself. So that tells you right there, you know, about certain substances. And, and if you couple that with someone that has an obsessive personality, you may never stop drinking and you may die from it. Right. I also think, you know, I, I talked one time about the firehouse. The firehouse is a very um, group mentality kind of thing. The person with the loudest voice tends to drive the people in one direction. And, and, and a lot of times, if somebody walks in there and speaks up against the person with the loudest voice, the, the group tends to shift in the other direction. And that's what, you know, everyone in this in this feed has done. You know, uh, Brandon, Brandon and everyone is they, they've walked into a room. 
And they've said like, yo, being sober is fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being sober. By the way, I'm still the life of the party. And everyone's like, huh, huh? Yeah, maybe, maybe that is the way to go. And maybe they'll have a couple less drinks that night. Like it's, it's, it's definitely when, when someone with the biggest status or just the person that's willing to push against the David against the Goliath, like just willing to push against what everyone else is doing. A lot of times you create a huge monumental shift in people's thought processes. And that next day may be their first day sober because they're like, Dude, Mike was in there killing it, man. You know, making everyone laugh, having a great time. And he didn't have an ounce to drink like that. That's what a lot of people need to see. I, I always say my brother passed away October 13th, 20, 2013. And I always say I wish that he got to see Mike where he is today because he's always looked up to Mike. Mike's been in my family for we we met in college, years, so yeah. we've known each other for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And when my brother had passed, Mike was going through his own ups and downs and active addiction, but I wish, and my mom even said it then too, cause she does a lot of work in Al-Anon and that kind of stuff to help her heal through the grieving process. And we just wish he had these huge people of influence showing him how cool it is to do it, to do life this way. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks Lauren. I know I, I wish I, I hear you on that one. Absolutely. Um, and I think as family members to our loved ones that are in this recovery, us not being ashamed of it and us being proud of it and building it up as a strength and something we were really just, yes. Um, and that's, I, I think that's our part too, right? It's like to support our loved ones getting sober and being sober and, and having that too. So thank you for that. I love it. I, I love that. And I agree. Let's not stop. Let's keep going. No. The, the disease is not going to stop. So we can't either. Right? Yeah. And I also like the fact that we have this panel that we're working together and we can use each other to leverage our own strengths to help each other move forward in this movement. Um, and I think it's important to team up. And, and this is uh, the beginning, beginning of it right here. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the whole village to raise a child mantra, if you will. Thank you. Yeah, was, so I got, I've gotten I've received some of the raddest feedback. From, from stuff that Mike, you and I, that we've done together and, and Jason as well. And they're like, wait, why, why or how do you connect with these guys? And, you know, it's just so cool to see the cross promotion. Someone and, commented that you commented on one of my videos. They were like, yeah. holy crap, Brandon <laughs> Ovex. <laughs> I laughed so hard. Dude. And normally our paths would not have crossed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just wouldn't have. And it's, it's the coolest thing, man. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And actually you guys are touching right in on something else. Um, Luke, I wanted to talk to you about, we're talking about getting people help. And I think another way that Banyan's trying to move is, and is moving is to help people with state insurance. Um, I know Delaware is now accepting Medicaid um, and we want to get these resources and get this out to everybody. And, you know, there's different avenues for that. I just want to make sure that the listeners and all of us could, you know, we focus on how to get everybody that treatment. And so Luke, my question is that what are some of the resources that you have out there um, for people who need uh, treatment, who have maybe no insurance or state insurance? Um, how do you tackle that, uh, helping people and, and things like that? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, Banyan is 16 facilities across the country. And we are trusted by about 100 different insurance providers um, that we have in-network contracts with. So we can just about take any private insurance policy. But one thing that's been really cool is our ownership. They have now contracted with different states so that we could take Medicaid. And so it really opened up our net to help a ton more people. And I know one of the big stigmas for, or one of the big barriers for people to go into treatment is they feel like they don't have the right insurance. They don't have money. You know, I want to say this loud and clear that everybody deserves recovery. And that regardless of your financial or religion or your ethnicity, that you are loved and that you deserve help. And so there's a team of about 60 of me at Banyan scattered all across the country that have about a thousand working relationships with other facilities. And so we all the time, I know people reach out to Brandon and Mike, we can, if you have absolutely nothing, there's a road for you to get help somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as long as you're open to a different path, we have a team of experts across the country mm -hmm. that can help you. So it might not be with Banyan but understand that you are worthy of that help and that 
we together can come up with some sort of game plan to get you, you know, a chance at recovery. One uh-huh. of the things I fell in love with with Banyan was I had a firefighter call say, hey, I need to get help. We didn't take his insurance. It was just unfortunate. It was one of the insurances that we couldn't take because of state restrictions and stuff like that. It's like he said, there's 60 other people. Not everyone's as good looking as Luke, though. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there was, there was a team of 60 people. And throughout that network, we found the perfect facility for them that took their insurance. We were able to get them the help that they needed. Our end result is we're humans. We want to help people. And that will always be the baseline of who we are. Right. If you want treatment, reach out. That's the bottom line. hundred percent. We'll figure it out. Especially with Banyan. If you want help or you know someone who needs help and you want to work with people that can help in that direction, call, call Banyan. You know, let's just make that happen. Um, yeah. All right. I'll get off my bandwagon for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's also important to mention, I saw a number of people uh, DM me And they're like, you know, how did you do it? How did you put your life on hold? And I'm thinking to myself, what do you mean put your life on hold? Until you handle this problem that is addiction. And if you don't handle it, you may not make it to treatment. You may die. You know what I'm saying? You know, and by me going to treatment, I found a better way to live. And like Brandon said, I wouldn't be the man I am today and have all the things that I have if I didn't go to treatment. I'm sure MTV would have not given me a contract five years ago, if I was still the same person, you know, back in the day in the networks, they didn't trust me. They're like, oh, he's, he gets a lot of attention, but we can't trust him to show up or we don't know if he's going to leave a set or throw a microphone at someone and just leave and go cop something, you know, now, five years later, I'm dependable. People want to work with me. Um, it's, it's nothing but positive vibes. And that's all because of me giving up my way of thinking and just having acceptance and saying, you know what, my best way is not working. I got to do, I got to ask the professionals. I got to go to rehab. All hands need to go on deck right now. It's for my life. Yeah. I kind of, I, I, I man, he was spot on when he said Mike just there. And it's funny because I get a lot of messages like that too. And I said, look, I, I, I'm just going to pride myself here on being a realist. And right now you have this job that you don't want to miss, but the reality is you're a junkie with a job and there's not a, 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 there's not too much longevity with that job. I guarantee you, your face is not hanging on the wall as the employee of the month. You're probably (laughs) holding on to it barely at best. Um, And you know what they told me in treatment and I really bought into it. They said, Brandon, how long have you been getting high drinking for? I said, 20, 24 years. And they said, okay, for 24 years, you've given up everything in life for one thing. Why don't you make a deal with us and give up one thing so you can get everything? That that made sense to me. I can give up that one thing. And I have. Randonisms. (laughs) 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 My eyes are like, can I take that note? (laughs) They So thank you guys. So thank you for that. And I want to, so Mike and Lauren, I'm going to switch to the little bit of the family importance here. Um, And what I really love is that we do, for those that don't know, um, we have Zoom family support groups. I call it a support group because that's really what it is. Uh, And every facility has one. And and I run one with one of my um, coworkers. And it's a way for, you know, there's no way to be an expert um, on any of this, though. I think families supporting each other during this time and just giving each other advice and thoughts. There isn't really like a manual on what to do, like you were saying, Lauren, earlier. It's more, how do we help and not hurt, right? So for me, it's like, how do I help support my loved one um, without doing for them what they can do for themselves? Uh, You know, the, the behind the messages, if I'm doing everything for them, then they're not learning how to, to live themselves. And they're not learning how to stay sober themselves. And unfortunately, I learned that the hard way. Um, and congratulations, Lauren, too, on being pregnant. That's amazing. My youngest is four. And I'll tell you, you it's uh, quite the learning lesson <laughs> for all of it. I think a lot of the Al-Anon stuff has really helped with my kid going totally off subject on that one. <laughs> so, um, it's, uh, it's important to really be able to build up the people we love and say, I trust you enough to know how to get sober by the people you're surrounding yourself with. And I don't need to do that for you. Not that I could anyway, but that I believe in you. Right. And, and you can do this. And that way it's really empowering that person. Um, and so I, my question really is uh, how critical is it for family involvement in recovering um, people with a recovering addiction and kind of your thoughts on that, Lauren and Mike too, and anyone else's too, just kind of what is for the families that are listening. Um, let's reach out to them too. And what, 
How important is this? Let's start from that part. I think it's extremely important for the family's involvement mm -hmm. in uh, the relationship and through the path of the addict seeking recovery. Uh, so many times, listen, addicts are geniuses yep. the majority of the time. Mm -hmm. The amount of effort and work yep. and around the clock they do <laughs> and obsessing mm -hmm. on a substance, whatever it may be, they could be channeling that into so many different things and be extremely successful individuals for the rest of their life. So they know if you're supporting them or not. Now, supporting them doesn't mean enabling. It doesn't mean you're agreeing with their choices. However, you should always have open lines of communication where that person knows that you're there for them at any time. The phone line's always open at any time when they're ready to get treatment or if they're, if they're sober and they're newly sober and they're struggling, just always having uh, that pipeline open so mm -hmm. that someone can pick up the phone and call you because the family member knows when, when the addict or the addict knows when the family member is closed off or, you know, they're so disappointed in me and I've heard them and it becomes this cycle where they don't want to hurt their family anymore, but their family doesn't want to be hurting. It's just like a horrible cycle of, of back and forth and who has to, who's to blame and who has these guilty feelings. Yeah. And there's really no way of healing that until you get sober and prove it one day at a time. But until then the families, you just need to, have a healthy relationship. And just like you said, you can't, you have to empower them by letting them make the decision, right? You can't create some toxic codependent relationship because if you're demanding them to get treatment in mm. order for you to be involved in their lives, you're making a complete codependency that's just never going to set you up for long-term success in any relationship, parent, child, or spouse, or anything like that. So you just need to keep those lines of communication open that you love them and you're always there for them anytime they're ready to make that lifestyle change. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's important that the it's optimal if the family would be educated uh, with these family groups. Um, so you kind of know what to expect um, and you sort of don't do the, um, the telltale bad things that you're not supposed to be doing. Um, because, but like I said, optimally, because a lot of times it doesn't happen like that. The families are not educated and, um, they'll be drinking around that person that may be trying to get, re you know, recovery. And, but like I said, optimally, it would be great for the family to get educated in support groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had this experience too, where I was like maybe 60 days sober and I was just came to an outpatient in Florida and my dad called me six times in a row and he I remember calling him back, screaming at him, like, give me my space. I'm doing great. And how a therapist described it to me is anyone that was attached to you by unconditional love has gone through addiction. And so my dad only had about five or six years of, you know, really negative experiences to fall back on. And now my dad, just like Lauren is saying, he runs an Al-Anon group and now he's recovering, you know, not to any fault of his own, but it is your responsibility for your recovery. And so now he's seeking that. And I encourage all families that have a loved one mm -hmm. uh, that is struggling with addiction to seek help for yourself too, because it's a whole separate battle, but yep. it's just as important because you can really aid um, in their recovery process. Yeah, great. And I, I'll say too, the, the part about having the family members address their own stuff around this is so important. And it's not up to, you know, Jason or Brandon or, or Mike or Luke to, to fix us, right? We're having our own issues around it that are real. And that's something we can go get support on. It's not for us to say, Brandon, fix me right now. Make me not scared if you're relapsed, right? That's not fair. That's not okay. And so it really it takes a lot of strength, I think, for the family members uh, to own their own emotion and get that addressed so that we can come together as family and support each other. And it really is somebody had said a family disease and it really is. So what are all of us doing together to not have that cycle continue? It's not easy. And so for families that are listening right now, it's, um, I think Lauren had said too, there's not like, here's the answer for everything, right? It's really, it doesn't work like that. Unfortunately, I, I wish it did. It just doesn't.
And I think some of it is understanding how to regulate your own feelings, your own past experiences, your own therapy issues. You know, every time Jason went to, you know, the Walmart on this road, he got high. I knew every single, every single time he went there, he got high. So now anytime I think about that Walmart or, hey, I'm going to the Walmart, they're immediately going to go back to that thought process. I went to a boot camp for kids because uh, I was a bad kid. I know that's going to be hard for a lot of people to imagine. <laughs> but, uh, so I was a bad kid and I went to this. What was so cool is when I went in, there was six months long. And the day I walked in there, I went to one side and my parents had to start going to parenting classes because they were so used to every time I would do something, they would ground me for six months because they're just so tired of me being a little jerk. So, you know, a, a lot of times this is uh, the families learning how to not react so aggressively to stuff or learning how to d cope with exactly what's going on and almost hitting the reset button and saying, all right, we've hit rock bottom. We are now coming back up. So let's do it together versus me trying to talk down or, or vice versa. And I, I think one other thing just to add, kind of how, how Luke said earlier, when you, uh, whoever loved you unconditionally throughout your addiction had got walked it with you, 1,000% yeah. is exactly what the family members are going through. And just how you mentioned, Jason, um, those memories of when someone went to that Walmart or when here, like, I remember, like, and if I drive by a place, like, I remember it. And it, whether it has to do with his connection of, of, of active addiction or my brother's, and guess what? We're sober through it all, the family members. So we really remember that shit for life. Yeah. <laughs> now it's just, you have to, the family members really need to work on themselves because those memories don't always go away. You just have to learn how to heal your way through it, that it's okay to have them and they just live in the past. I always say that, uh, Lauren, I'm glad you touched on that. When I'm talking to family members, I, I let them know that, unfortunately, you got the deal the worst. Yeah. The real MVP in the stories are, are my fiance, my mother, anyone who crosses paths with me. Unfortunately, you guys are the ones that, that you basically suffer with the disease of addiction, but unfortunately, you don't reap the benefits of getting high from it, right? Like you just get all the negative repercussions that comes from us getting high and, uh, so then we get these people into treatment and, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection, right? So the last thing I want is for, for the individual to get out of treatment and the family to say, oh, I've been told to create these boundaries and leave you alone. No, I believe that we need to set healthy and unhealthy boundaries. We say what we mean. We mean what we say. And the reality is for a lot of years. We've been taking, meaning the family members have been taking information from the sickest person in the room. The sickest person in the room has been given the directions or the blueprints or the, the play for what we're going to do. So the reality is everyone is sick as can be. Everyone is as sick as can be. And, and we have the, 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 the individual in treatment, you know, requiring all these different lines of help from therapists, psychiatrists, you know, you, you name it, the, the steps, the guy, all this stuff. The family needs to go to Al-Anon. They need to kind of understand and process and grieve their own loss, their own thoughts. They're, they're just to kind of regroup, they, they, you know, and, uh, and then collectively we can meet on a team level and work together for the greater good. Right. But if, if, if one team doesn't get the help while the other team is, you kind of, it just becomes a wash, rinse, repeat. A hundred percent because there's, there's so much resentment on the family side especially when the addict's getting newly treatment. They could still be in rehab. They could just be out of rehab. And it's just it's just what your experience has told you. And you, you can't get out of your own way. And if you don't work on that, it's just they're never going to build that relationship. Yeah. Thank you all. And I really, I want to touch on something um, that's with you, Jason, and trauma. Um, what I've seen a lot of is, you know, we do these uh, different research outcomes for JACO and, you know, publishable outcomes. And so we're measuring trauma symptoms, we're measuring suicide ideation, depression, anxiety. And from what I've seen this past year, I've seen a lot more of trauma symptoms being reported. Have you seen PTSD symptoms or trauma symptoms in your coworkers and the people you work with? And if you have, do you feel like they're getting those symptoms addressed? Um, they are, you know, what's crazy about, we always, we always say with first responders is, A, like you said, we, we see things that people should never see. You know, I've seen, you know, dead kids and people cut in half and stuff like that. And it's like, you see stuff that you, as you're seeing it, 
you're, and I can, I can tell you from personal experience, I, I looked at a lady one time and I won't get into details, but I'm looking at her and one side of my brain is going, this isn't real. There's no way this is real. Like I shouldn't be seeing this right now. And the other side of my brain is going, what is happening right now? So we, you know, we have a lot of those, those problems where you see stuff you should never see. And then you go back to your guys, the guys, your crew, and you're like, yo, uh, th that was really weird. And they're like, if you can't take it, bro, then you're not, you shouldn't be a part of this business. Like, okay, that's not the way we should be handling any of this. But I say the biggest traumas that I believe come to a lot of firefighters or first responders in general, it happens before we even get on the job. So we get on the job, something traumatic happens or they see something like they, or they see a movie and they're like, I'm going to save that kid. I'm going to pull him out of the fire. and We're good to go. And then they go on that first call where they're supposed to pull that kid out. They can't, they can't pull the kid out or they pull the kid out and the kid's dead or, or whatever it is. And now that thing, that, that level that they built themselves up to, they never achieved it. And everything that they've worked for in the last 20 years of their life or however long it took them to get to that point is destroyed. So, you know, th this, this thought process of themselves being a hero is very quickly diminished. And then God forbid there are additional or, or we call it like micro issues leading up to this. The PTSD is real, but these guys are not able to go back to their fellow brothers and sisters and just say, yo, that was really bad and have somebody validated and not make fun of them and not be like, oh, what's wrong with you, man? Like you deal with this. You don't. We're not supposed to see these things. But so just addressing it, addressing the issue then it's much faster to be able to move on past it. So that that's kind of the stuff where I see, but the guys at work or people around me, I know when they're depressed because their personalities change immediately. And it's, and it doesn't have to be, they, they're, they're depressed in air or they're, um, you know, not talking or whatever. It could be the opposite. They're the normally very talkative person. And now they're not talking or they're normally the not talkative person. And now they're hyperactive. They're, you know, they're, hey, everything's fine, man. We're good to go. And then they walk out the door kind of thing. So uh, finding addressing and then, approaching someone in a non-judgmental way can truly change the trajectory of somebody's life. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, it, it, we all have emotions, male, female, uh, anyone that's a human that has a brain that has emotions. We all feel it. We all have tear ducts. We, uh, so let's break another stigma. It's okay to cry. <laughs> it's I okay to crying. have a depression. Crying is one of my favorite emotions. I mean, I don't do it often. You know, I always say if you're crying four times a shift, you need therapy. Uh, but, you know, like you know, a good cry, man, you watch a good movie, you just, you know, like, like the tears are flowing. You feel genuinely better after the hormone release from that is monstrous, dude. So, like, it's a good thing to cry. It's, it's awesome. I actually think that um, I don't cry often, but some of the times that I've recently cried, I cried the day I married my wife here. I also cried um, the day that uh, Banyan surprised me with a uh, five-year plaque because I knew how hard that was. Uh, and I'm sure you guys understand it. It's not easy to walk that road of sobriety and really, really do it. Uh, so when they surprised me and gave me the plaque of five years recently, I teared up because it, it meant that much to me. So I, I feel that it's okay to cry um, as it's, it's definitely a release. That's a, it's a good thing. You got a big crying day coming to you soon, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Um, does anyone else want to touch on? Because I think Pete, trauma can happen in all areas of our life, depending on the level. You know, there's there's different types of trauma. Sometimes, you know, um, different losses, different emotions. Does anyone help anything else on trauma symptoms, or maybe, you know, I don't know yet, but I'm suspecting that COVID and and some kind of something is going to happen from that too. Um, and then we'll move on to social media, but any last thoughts on that one? Okay. I mean, I, I think trauma is going to happen in any, any big, big life events. You know, I, I remember the day that I was driven to prison. That was a big uh, event for me in my life where, you know, a lot of things were taken away from me, but I, um, but also um, me learning how to, um, you know, start my recovery or some of the things I have faced early and helped me to face prison. You know, if I didn't go through recovery, I wouldn't been able to, to handle uh, prison. So I handled prison the same way that I handled recovery one day at a time uh, and took accountability for my actions and put it behind me. So, but there was definitely some trauma with that as well. I mean, as you were saying that uh, Mike, I was thinking about, you know, immediately upon and even in treatment, Life as it's as a whole was a traumatic experience, right? I, I was so uncomfortable in my own skin. 
uh, and trying to figure out like who let me in and, and why, um, because I didn't have the comfort of a drink or a drug to, to remove me from me, which is what I did on a daily basis. So all I did, and, and we've, I've heard this talked about a lot on this panel today, is, is I continue to have faith that tomorrow will be better than today. Yeah. Provided I did not take a drink or a drug. And I believed in the process because I knew that my way no longer worked. And I, I simply, for the first time in my life, had to address the issue head on. Hence what you talked about going to prison. You know, you, you, you address it. You can't go around it, above it, below it. You, you simply confront it head on and know that if I've overcome you know, uh, addiction and and have found myself in sobriety. Let's just take a look at how magnificent of a feat that is. Let's not find that. And if we can do that, there's nothing that we can't do. And we use that as Jason just said, as a stepping stone, we look back at another experience that, that made us feel as overwhelmed or traumatic and, and, and we made it through that, you know, there's power in addressing the elephant in the room. Yeah. Take the power away from that immediately. To, oh man, I want to drink. And just looking at someone go, I really want to drink. And then being like, yeah, I get it. And you're like, oh, okay, I feel better. Like, like there's just power in, in removing that and just saying like, I'm uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable and I'm addressing it. And now we can move forward. Yeah, no, I, I love that. The strength that you get from recovery is like a, a superpower. Like, like, uh, like Brandon said, you can pretty much do anything. So he's like, when I went to prison, I knew that I can handle it because recovery was so much harder. Totally. I think, I think one important thing to note is that trauma comes in all different shapes and sizes and that um, we all kind of grew up in this generation and me growing up in Northeast Ohio, it's like a very blue collar town. As a man, I got myself into this problem. I have to get myself out. And the problem was that thinking – was going to lead to my ultimate suicide or overdose. And so I think it's very important for people to understand that there's professionals. Yeah. Though you don't understand this trauma, they do. And they can help work, work with you through it. Because I remember the first time I cried in like 15, 20 years was in treatment to a therapist and just like unloaded everything. And the Kent state wrote a paper on me that I was the toughest guy ever to play there. 40 straight games, never missed a practice, never changed his socks. You know, and and it was like, I never missed it. I never, I was a tough guy. And when I was able to let that guard down and redefine what a man looks like um, with a professional, things started to change in my life. I like you said, man, that's exactly it, bro. Men cry, man. It's part of life. That's right. If I ever get a million subscribers on YouTube, I'm crying. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's, and you know what? I I love that too. Thank you guys, all of you. Um, I could stay on that, but I know we're going to get to social media and go in that direction. Um, so I appreciate all the thoughts on that and, and what it means to be a man is not the traditional tough, but you guys seem to have that really solid. Um, when it comes to social media, these I have some questions and this is for everybody to answer. Uh, one of them is, um, what challenges do you face? I know that you guys have said a lot about the positives for social media um, and how it's been more used and, and there's been more avenues for it, which I'm so glad to hear. Are there any challenges that come up with merging the world or being part of the social media that um, you know you want to talk about? It's just, you're never going to get a hundred percent approval rate. I don't care who you're doing, or who you are and what you're doing. I usually press the restrict button, which means they're still a fan and they're still a follower. And that still helps my numbers and my bottom line. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, it's also uh, when you understand psychology, um, if someone says something negative, it says more about them than it says about you. And it's sort yeah. of like a mirror. Once you understand that and that uh, humans are very emotional beings, I don't take it very personal at all. They could be having a bad day. And a lot of the times, once in a while, um, when someone says something negative, I I know what I'm going to get back in in response. I'll send them God bless. They could say, Mike, I hope you jumped off a bridge or whatever it is. Do you want to know what they say like clockwork every single time? I just wanted to get your attention. Mm. So it's sort of once you understand psychology. So now I don't even, doesn't even bother me. I don't even block people anymore. I just restrict them and, and that's it. And I understand that these people may be having a bad day and hurt people, hurt people. And, uh, and that's really it. You know, I mean, um, we, you know, go, we, in recovery, we come across people that don't have the tools in their tool belt, yeah. you know, 
uh, Brandon does. And Brandon's got some cool things to say, but he's learned that over years and years of, of recovery and therapy and trial and error. Um, I can't expect uh, someone else that on the streets to have that type of intellect or, or that type of, or, or, you know, to be evolved like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always say that, you know, again, I said, I said it before that uh, my disease is centered in perspective and, and, and I am always the problem, right? And, and all I can control is me. The moment that I put expectations on other, I am immediately setting myself up for failure or a, a resentment, right? It, it is impossible to believe that I can control any person, place, or thing ever. Yep. So the sooner that I can understand and realize that, the easier my life becomes because all that I can control is my thinking, my attitude, and my behavior. So it makes the world like less heavy. Um, and, and after all, what I know is that through my own recovery is that we're all sick people. We're all sick. And, and I, I don't know what your sickness looks like as opposed to mine. Even in sobriety, I'm still a really sick person in different areas. And, and uh who am I to say how, how they should act, respond, or, uh, you know, and if you catch me at, at the right time, which it does happens, I, I will, you know, come back with a, a praying hands emoji or a heart, or maybe a kiss if I'm feeling really frisky. Yeah, uh, same. Same. <laughs> and, uh, and I leave it at that, but I come from an era in the beginning, which was exactly opposite of this, that any press was good press. And then I get sober and I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't really work in this world because people are kind of looking at me to have some answers, believe it or not, sometimes. Um, and I really had to tighten up the way that I carry myself and pay yep. attention that it's not all about me anymore. And, and that, again, is the exact opposite of my disease of addiction, which is I'm selfish and I'm self-centered. So it's me, 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 me. And if I have two minutes, you, but only if it benefits me. So, you know, at, at my... To tell how well I'm doing in my recovery is by incidents like this when, when I get negative remarks, which I do because people say, God, when I was getting high and drinking and drugging, you know, when are you going to die? I made it to the uh, celebrity death poll. There's this thing that they bet on every year and it's this big thing and they put celebrities' names in it. And I was on that and I was supposed to die. And, and a lot of, I made a lot of people upset because I didn't die and they lost money. And then I transition to this sober dude who's like living this really rad life. And I get comments like, is everything recovery to you? Uh, if I ask you what your favorite color is, don't say recovery. That's not a color. You know what I mean? It's like, you can't please them all, man. <laughs> you, know what book changed, you know what book changed my life in the perspective on this? I don't know if anyone else, uh, the four agreements. Yeah. Uh, she's big into the four agreements. So good. Yeah. So good. Like it truly made you stop. And yeah. look at other people. Uh, and, and I truly, truly, truly enjoyed it, man. It was such a great book for me. It was life-changing. I gave it to my mom and a bunch of friends and other stuff. And it was it was very, very cool. Also, when people comment negative things on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, it bumps your algorithm. So it works out great for you. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that book is life-changing. And yeah. I, that correlation of that with social media is the best piece of advice I ever could have heard for social, how to deal with social media, for Thank sure. You. Thank you. What's funny too is I heard everyone mention, not, not that I have nearly the national platform that all you guys have, and mine's a little bit more targeted towards sports, but I've heard everyone kind of reference their faith. And I think that we all done this to a higher calling. Like I mentioned that it's a pain to purpose. And one thing my dad always told me when I was playing sports is if you live for the applause, you'll die with the booze. Yeah. And so Knowing that we're not doing this for a round of applause, we're doing this for the person that we don't know we're helping, you know, we're not going to see that reward in on earth. But, I uh, think Lucasms was just born. Yeah, yeah. no, I, 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 like I like that. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, a good. That's pretty good. It's uh, seek respect, not attention. It lasts longer. I like that one. But yeah. also, what Brandon said was, I, I like the fact that um, he brought up expectations. A lot of people don't know that that's a huge, you know, problem. Expectations, pride, and ego. You got to run through a lot of daily decisions and confrontations and human uh, human uh, connection when it comes to ego, uh, pride, and expectations. Yeah. And so um, I don't have expectations either with with anyone, and it it, it, it leaves a lot of problems out. Oh yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's hard. I will not lie, man. I wake up a lot of days and, and, you know, in my life, in my recovery, I'm one of two ways. 
either don't you know who I am or, or please don't ask me who I am, right? I'm like, <laughs> that, like happy medium. And, and a lot of days I wake up with, I hear it said, but it's true, like untreated alcoholism. And, and so what I've learned to do is not touch my phone for like the first hour because I'll get on and I'll start scrolling Instagram, Facebook, and all of a sudden I'll let like the media that I'm consuming kind of control or dictate the outcome of my morning. Yeah. So it's better for me to just have like a fresh start and kind of, because I believe mentality creates reality, right? So like, what am I thinking? What I'm thinking is what I'm believing. And what I'm believing is what I'm portraying, not only to me, but to anybody yeah. else. Um, so it's, it's tough though, because if you're in a position to kind of, you know, do some things and create some change, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. So when I, when I snap back with a, a response to a text off impulse without really thinking it through, I, I can like, create some damage and I'm like, shit. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like you're about to come off with like a paragraph dissertation and all of a sudden in your brain, it's like hashtag growth and you delete it. You're like, Oh, rewind. <laughs> totally. You know how many arguments I've won writing an entire paragraph on Facebook? Like, <laughs> and then I'm like, ah, no, and I don't hit it. Uh, uh, like, all right, forget it. And then you yeah, yeah. I right there. Really <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an yeah. excellent skill. It reminds me of the DBT, the wise mind. Uh, what which mind are you gonna act in? And mm -hmm. it's a hard whether you're in recovery or not, it's hard to to not act on impulse and uh, respond really angrily in those situations. I tell new medics, take one breath. Take, close your eyes, take one breath, and you'd be super impressed what happens on the other side of that breath. So, and, yeah. a, and, and a lot of times people are not ready to hear your perception. They're, you know, they're, they might be very um, dead set on what they have to say. So it's like, you know, if you argue with a fool, it only proves that there are two fools. So yeah. a lot yeah. of the time, silence is the best answer. Yeah. yeah. I, whenever I'm about to respond, I always have to say to myself, and I do it on a daily basis, probably at least four times a day. Um, it's much better to come from a position of understanding as opposed to being understood. Yeah. And, and then, I, you know, and the answer is, if we're in recovery, acceptance is the answer to all. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it is what it is. I've learned from this entire thing that everyone on this is very intelligent and I need many more phrases in my vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> Rattling these off. Man. <laughs> no, I love this. I, I'm having so much fun with you guys. I'm just so where all of you are in your recovery and everything. It's way past. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not trying to compare. I'm just saying you're, you're really um, enlightened. If I can use a word uh, that's not just for recovery, but for anybody who's walking around in this, this earth is to yep. just have a sense of who am I, what am I giving off to others? And so, uh, yeah, great, great work. Um, I want to ask uh, for everybody again, what can I do? What can we do? What can the people that are listening, what can we do to bring validity and respect to the industry, to what you all are doing, to the, the platforms you're creating? how can I jump on that? And how can the listeners, you know, other people like me who are going, I want to, what can I do? You know, how can we help bring validity and respect to what you all are doing? I think uh -huh. in general, just respecting a, another person's journey, understanding that, you know, people's journeys are completely different than others. You know, I just stopped drinking because I didn't like the way I was acting, you know, or the way I was, I was thinking like, that's my journey, you know, who knows what the further journey will be. Um, you know, it, respecting the way other people are and, and understanding that, you know, uh, Brandon won't act the same way that I will, the same way that Mike will, you know, and just, and, and actually finding joy in uh, the differences in humans. I think that that's yeah. a big thing. And, and genuinely appreciating the fact that if you did not have ups, you would not have downs. And if you didn't have the downs, you wouldn't appreciate the ups like that. That's, that's how I I've always lived my life. Jasonism number one. Mm, <laughs> um, I would probably just say to uh, educate yourself uh, on the subject. Uh, don't be so close-minded. Uh, kindness is the new culture and be the change that you want to see. Mm. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That. I like that. What does advocacy mean to everybody, to you all? Um, I, I guess I'll start. I, advocacy means to me that I'm simply a product of my environment. I, I was a guy that 
that was hopeless and helpless without a cause and indefinite search for a destination. And, and, and I fail miserably every time. And, 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 and I'm a firm believer, a hard head makes for a soft ass. And I, I had failed so many times that I, I found myself in a position that I was willing to, to do whatever it took to get myself out of this position. And, and, and miraculously, I was not only able to get sober, but stay sober. And, uh, I, I'm just so grateful at the results from from you know my recovery that I believe and I can't get enough of talking about it. And if it were up to me, I would scream it from the rooftops. Hence, using my platform of social media and and whatever other outlet uh, that I have. You know, it it would be completely asinine for me to receive such a beautiful gift that every one of us, and I literally mean every one of us out there are entitled to. Every one of us are entitled to this beautiful gift that all of us panelists have received. Um, but unfortunately, I believe a lot of people miss opportunities of how to better themselves because they're simply not aware. Mm -hmm. So here we are. Yes. Um, you know what? Um, I, I love exactly what Brandon said. I just feel that, you know, uh, I'm a phoenix and I was meant to rise from the ashes, okay, and show other people that they can do it too. And um, I was meant to fall, you know, in such a big way in, in the public eye, but I was also meant to rise in, in, in even more spectacular fashion uh, so that, you know, like all of us, all of us, we're proving that the comeback is greater than the setback. Yeah, I think what they both said combined just – for me, being an advocate is in the recovery world mm -hmm. is leaving judgment at the door mm -hmm. and opening up kindness and sharing our stories from the family side and his side to just share our message and inspire others to live a better life. Yep. Uh, I mean, I can't top the Phoenix. <laughs> That's perfect. There, there was perfect. <laughs> you know, I think uh, we've, we've all, to some degree, seen our greatest pain in life become a purpose. And, you know, I, um, people ask me all the time, and I tell them, you know, I would never, although I lost my NFL dream, I would never trade anything that happened in my life, you know, outside of some hurting some people. Um, because now that platform, you know, combined with this new life has just given me, um, a life that I never even imagined for myself. And so um, being able to help somebody switch that light on um, through faith and through recovery has just it's become my life work. It's become Brandon's and Mike's and Jason's. And um, I'm sure everyone in here remembers that moment when they're like, it flipped and you're like, you never thought it would flip. And you now wanted to show other people that it could flip. Yeah. And um, I remember that moment vividly. And I remember building up a foundation to a point where I felt confident enough to, to put myself out there, which yep. I was healthy and strong when I did. And, um, you know, I think advocacy, you know, regardless of all the trolls, even though I have a limited number of trolls, it's the person that we don't get to see that we help that helps me go to sleep at night. It makes all the world a difference to me. I think the advocacy came down to the fact that I walked into a realm and to a group of people that I never knew existed. And, I, and in that moment realized that I could look back to many other people and go, Hey, this, like, this is awesome, man. Like this is the way becoming a whole human through your mental health, going to therapy and enjoying it and liking it will, will satisfy your life so much more. And then I realized that there were a million people behind that going, dude, that's awesome. Let's do it together. And that's what a lot of this has become. Yeah. And what Luke said, I mean, there's always going to be naysayers out there, man. You know what I'm saying? Um, you just got to tell them that, listen, I'm sorry that my spirit irritates your demons. <laughs> just, you I know. Like that. I like that one. That's like, like the most epic shirt ever. A phoenix rising out of the ashes and a spirit just hanging out there. Just so are, are you guys going to sue me if I start stealing these and putting them on my own shirt? <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude, that's awesome. You guys, you I'm branded it like you start like, like a t-shirt company. You, you start banging out one-liners and two-liners. You know? I, dude, I would kill to see like someone like, F you, bro, and then him like, listen, man. I'm sorry, my spirit uh, messes with your DNA. Like, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> they wouldn't even know what to do. That'd be incredible. <laughs> Full disclosure, I'm stealing it. <laughs> yeah, that'd be so cool. <laughs> yep.
Okay, so, you know, the last question I want to um, talk about before going into the closing is um, what are each of your long term goals uh, with regards to mental health and substance use in the community? And uh, the one of my favorite questions here, I didn't come up with this question, though I love the question is, what footprint do you hope to leave? Somebody say, what footprint do you hope to leave um, with those future goals? I would like to redefine the way that first responders or humans in general uh, read or, or uh, describe themselves as men, the way that manliness is truly defined. That's what I want it to be. I want it to be that to be a, a man or be a human or, or a whole woman, whatever it is, is accepting the fact that crying is just as normal as laughing. And, and I think that would be, that would be the footprint that, that I would like to leave. Awesome. Um, I would probably say that, um, I would probably want someone to, if, if it's only one person that they hear my story and they don't give up and they say that, you know what, if Mike can do it, I can do it. I think that I, I would be winning. Also, may, I'm just going to continue to take it one day at a time. I'm going to continue to celebrate my victories. And hopefully that uh, between all of us, we can continue to bring the message, uh, you know, into the into 2021. And I think to continue, just share our messages together and make sure my brother Christopher's life wasn't lost in vain. Mm -hmm. And if any other family members or any young kids or anyone can relate to that story and change their path, yep. that alone is just worth me continuing to share his story and his memory. Yep. Absolutely. Um, for me, I, Mike just said it and I'm basically going to mimic what he said. I, I was sitting in my 13th detox and, and I just felt hopeless and helpless and uh, completely destined for failure. And they played uh, one of my mentor and dear friend by the name of Chris Herring's video. And, uh, and, and it was at that moment, going back to the cry that we talked about, I hadn't cried for many years, right? I was so disconnected from reality and, and they played his documentary in this detox. And it was at that very moment that I believed that I could do it because I'm witnessing someone else who lived the way I lived. And, and if justice was due, he would have been dead years ago. And he's talking about this really awesome life. And I had to get up from the group and I walked outside to continue this cry because I couldn't let all the people see me cry, right? And it was at that moment I believed that I could do it and things were going to be different. And uh, and that's what I've proceeded to do is, is just, God willing, allow my, to, my story to become a form of attraction rather than promotion. And, and if I can push someone one person to believe that they can do it, then they can do it to another two become four, four become eight, eight become 16. And then we truly begin to change the world and addiction uh, and the stigma upon it from that perspective. Yeah. And just to, again, echo what everyone else said, and I love what, what Lauren added, um, just to carry everyone's cross and to keep people's spirits alive. And um, life is hard in general even outside of addiction, maybe you're watching this, you don't even know if you are an addict or if you have an addiction issue or maybe you're addicted to alcohol, you don't know. Um, just understand that we love you and that there's a whole team of, of uh, people at Banyan Treatment Center that uh, can help you through this journey. And mm. so um, that's become my goal, take it one day at a time. And uh, I'm blessed to be surrounded by a bunch of great people, especially this panel. So again, with closing, I just want to thank each of our panelists and joining us today in this discussion and uh, the recovery advocates and the recovery work that everybody's doing. I want to really say thank you for turning in. For those of you who have tuned in to watching this um, discussion, I'm hoping it gives you some peace and some hope for getting your own recovery or helping a loved one to seek recovery. On behalf of everyone at Banyan, myself included, we look forward to a positive year of growth in 2021 and continuing to help our population and families with this disease. And we are also excited to announce we have two new locations opening up. Uh, one will be in Wilbur, Texas, and the other one will be in Baldwinville, Massachusetts. So look forward to that opening soon. Also, reminder, we are uh, accepting Medicaid. We do have a facility that's working with Medicaid. And so whatever insurance you have to just call, get some help. Let's see what we can do to find the right resources and the right facility for you or a loved one. So please do give us a call or visit BanyanCenters.com for more information. Again, that's BanyanCenters.com. You can do a chat or you could talk to somebody live. It's really what's more comfortable for you. Um, 
Uh, one other development is that we're now also accepting veterans through our VA Optimum network nationwide. So if you're a veteran or you know a veteran that's struggling with this disease or dual addiction, mental health, uh, please seek out uh, BanyanCenters.com and we'll be able to provide some help in that area as well. So veterans, we uh, would love to work with you as well. So please come on and join our team and our treatment. I just want to say thank you guys so much. I thought this was really awesome. I would like to do more things like this. Um, everyone's input was just so, uh, you know, like Elizabeth said, everyone's so evolved and enlightened. It's, it's so refreshing to be a part of this conversation. So uh, thank you guys so much. I'm very grateful and look forward to more of these that we do. And um, thank, you. Good recovery. thank you everybody for joining until next time. See you again on our next virtual talk.